Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash adventures in audio. Over 150,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Hello, my friend. I hope you are doing well. Please allow me to introduce myself, as the Rolling Stones would say. I'm Robert Crandall, and this is Short Stories, a production of AdventuresInAudio.net. I want to thank you for listening to this podcast, and I hope you enjoy it, and if you do, please share it with someone. I feature short stories of the horror and related genres with stories from authors like Edgar Allan Poe, H.P. Lovecraft, and others. Oh, by the way, I saw a, uh, I should have written this down, but I, there's an app now that uh, is for, has short stories on it from, uh, they mentioned Jack London, Edgar Allan Poe, H.P. Lovecraft, and others. I know I haven't done a Jack London story yet, but we will be getting to one, so hang in there. If you like listening to short stories, uh, be sure to check out the stories that you'll find on audible.com and take advantage of their special offer. Just for t- uh, trying out their 30-day free trial, you'll get a free audiobook. Go to audibletrial.com forward slash adventures and audio to sign up. You can take audiobooks anywhere you want on your smartphone, tablet, or laptop, and you can switch seamlessly between devices without losing your place. And you download your free their free mobile apps for iPhone and Android and and uh, download audiobooks for offline listening or stream instantly over Wi-Fi and 3G. And you'll find thousands of bestsellers, new releases, classic favorites, all kinds of lots of lots of uh, Poe and Lovecraft and many others in that genre. And you'll find um, just everything you want, from comedy to just about anything. Over 150,000 titles to choose from. You can stream audiobooks instantly in almost well, on any internet-enabled device. So, to take advantage of the 30-day free trial and get a free audiobook, go to audibletrial.com forward slash adventures in audio. Now, for the story on this episode, this is very special story for me. Some uh, uncanny events brought this story to my attention. It was Thursday, December 4th, 2011. I had a dream, or should I say a nightmare. In this dream, I was walking up a staircase with other people I did not know. Upon reaching the top step, I lost my balance and fell backward, groping in thin air, and began rolling down this long staircase. As I rolled onto each step, I let out a cry of pain and agony. Unable to stop the momentum, the pain increased and the cries of agony grew louder until about halfway down. Suddenly, the sounds of terror ceased. One man in the crowd at the top of the stairs spoke out. He's dead dead. I immediately awoke, shaking, trembling, in a cold sweat. Wow, it was only a dream. Also in the dream, I was out of body watching this happen. Strange, very strange. On Saturday, I had to visit a friend of mine at his office. We were working on a project together And when I arrived, I opened the door and I saw a long staircase leading to his office on the second floor. 
no elevator was available. By the way, to this day, I avoid stairs, uh, if at all possible. Then the next day, I checked my email and found an email from the Library of America. I subscribed to their free short story of the week. Oh, good, I thought. I wonder what this week's story is. Titled, The Shadowy Third. Didn't cause any alarm until I read the story. In this story, a young nurse is hired to care for the wife of a famous surgeon. The wife is diagnosed as insane, but the nurse finds her to be of sound mind. Then there's a young girl that only the wife and the nurse can see. The girl died not long ago. The surgeon has other romantic interests, and the plot thickens, and you will see how the story relates to my dream and how the visit to my colleague's office, how it all comes together and becomes the shadowy third. I hope you'll enjoy The Shadowy Third by Ellen Glasgow. When the call came, I remembered that I turned from the telephone in a romantic flutter, though I had spoken only once to the great surgeon Roland Meredith. I felt that on that December afternoon, that to speak to him only once, to watch him in the operating room for a single hour, was an adventure which drained the color and excitement from the rest of my life. After all these years of work on typhoid and pneumonia cases, I can still feel the delicious tremor of my young pulses. I can still see the winter sunshine slanting through the hospital windows over the white uniforms of the nurses. He didn't mention me by name. Can there be a mistake? I stood incredulous, yet ecstatic before the superintendent of the hospital. No, there isn't a mistake. I was talking to him before you came down. Miss Hemphill's strong face softened while she looked at me. She was a big, resolute woman, a distant Canadian relative of my mother's, and the kind of nurse I had discovered in the month since I came up from Richmond, that the northern hospital boards, if not northern patients, appear instinctively to select. From the first, in spite of her hardness, she had taken a liking. I hesitate to use the word fancy for preference so impersonal to her Virginia cousin. After all, it isn't every southern nurse, just out of training, who can boast a kinswoman in the superintendent of a New York hospital. If experience was what I needed, Miss Hemphill, I judged, was abundantly prepared to supply it. And he made you understand positively that he meant me? The thing was so wonderful that I simply couldn't believe it. He asked particularly for the nurse, who was with Miss Hudson last week when he operated. I think he didn't even remember that you had a name. This isn't the South, you know, where people still regard nurses as human, not as automata. When I asked if he meant Miss Randolph, he repeated that he wanted the nurse who had been with Miss Hudson. She was small, he said, and cheerful-looking. This, of course, might apply to one or two others, but none of these was with Miss Hudson. Miss Malpin, the only other nurse except you, who went near her, is large and heavy. Then I suppose it's really true. My pulses were tingling. And I'm to be there at six o'clock? Not a minute later. The day nurse goes off duty at that hour, and Mrs. Meredith is never left by herself for an instant. It is her mind, isn't it? And that makes it all the stranger that he should select me, for I've had so few mental cases. So few cases of any kind. 
Miss Hemphill was smiling, and when she smiled I wondered if the other nurses would know her. By the time you've gone through the treadmill in New York, Margaret, you will have lost a good many things besides your inexperience. I wonder how long you will keep your sympathy and your imagination. After all, wouldn't you have made a better novelist than a nurse? I can't help putting myself into my cases. I suppose one ought not to. It isn't a question of what one ought to do, but of what one must. When you are drained of every bit of sympathy and enthusiasm, and you've got nothing in return for it, not even thanks, you will understand why I try to keep you from wasting yourself. But surely in a case like this, for Dr. Meredith? Well, well, of course, for Dr. Meredith. She must have seen that I implored her confidence, for after a minute she let fall almost carelessly a gleam of light on the situation. It is a very sad case when you think what a charming man and a great surgeon Dr. Meredith is. Above the outstretched collar of my uniform, I felt the blood leap in bounds to my cheeks. I have spoken to him only once, I murmured, but he is charming and oh so kind and handsome, isn't he? His patients adore him. Oh yes, I've seen that. Everyone hangs on his visits. Like the patients and other nurses, I also had come by delightful, if imperceptible degrees, to hang on the daily visits of Dr. Meredith. He was, I suppose, born to be a hero to women. Fate had selected him for the role, and it would have been sheer impertinence for a mortal to cross wills with the invisible powers. From my first day in his hospital, from the moment we watched through closed shutters, while he stepped out of his car, I have never doubted that he was assigned to the great part of the play. If I had been ignorant of his spell, of the charm he exercised over his hospital, I should have felt in the waiting hush like a drawn breath, which followed his ring at the door and preceded his imperious footsteps on the stairs. My first impression of him, even after the terrible events of the next year, records a memory that is both careless and splendid. At that moment, when gazing through the chinks in the shutter, I watched him in his coat of dark fur cross the pavement over the pale streaks of sunshine. I knew beyond any doubt, I knew with a sort of infallible prescience, that my fate was irretrievably bound with his in the future. I knew this. I repeat, though Miss Hemphill would still insist that my foreknowledge was merely a sentimental gleaning from indiscriminate novels. But it wasn't only first love, impressionable as my kinswoman believed me to be. It wasn't only the way he looked, handsome as he was, even more than his appearance, more than the shining dark of his eyes, the silvery brown of his hair, the dusky glow in his face, even more than his charm and his magnificence. I think the beauty and sympathy in his voice won my heart. It was a voice, I heard someone say afterward, that ought always to speak poetry. So you will see why, if you do not understand at the beginning, I can never hope to make you believe impossible things. So you will see why I accepted the call when it came, as an imperative summons. I couldn't have stayed away after he sent for me, however much I may have tried not to go. I know that in the end I must have gone. In those days, while I was still hoping to write novels, I used to talk a great deal about destiny. I have learned since then how silly all such talk is, and I suppose it's my destiny to be caught in the web of Roland Meredith's personality. But I am not the first nurse to grow lovesick about a doctor who never gave her a thought. I am glad you got the call, Margaret. It may mean a great deal to you. 
only try not to be too emotional about it. I remember that Miss Hemphill was holding a bit of rose geranium in her hand while she spoke. One of the patients had given it to her from a pot she kept in her room, and the scent of the flower is still in my nostrils, or my memory. Since then, oh long since then, I have wondered if she also had been caught in the web. I wish I knew more about the case. I was clearly pressing for light. Have you ever seen Mrs. Meredith? Oh, dear, yes. They have been married only a little over a year, and in the beginning she used to come sometimes to the hospital and wait outside while the doctor made his visits. She was a very sweet-looking woman then, not exactly pretty, but fair and slight, with the loveliest smile I think I have ever seen. In the first month she was so much in love that we used to laugh about it among ourselves. To see her face light up when the doctor came out of the hospital and crossed the pavement to his car was as good as a play. We never got tired watching her. I wasn't superintendent then, so I had more time to look out of the window while I was on day duty. Once or twice she brought her little girl in to see one of the patients. The child was so much like her that you would have known them anywhere for mother and daughter. I had heard that Mrs. Meredith was a widow with one child when she first met the doctor, and I asked now, still seeking an illumination I had not found. There was a great deal of money, wasn't there? A great fortune. If she hadn't been so attractive, people would have said, I suppose, that Dr. Meredith married her for her money only. She appeared to make an effort of memory. I believe I heard somehow that it was all left in trust away from Mrs. Meredith if she married again. I can't, to save my life, remember just how it was, but it was a queer will, I know, and Mrs. Meredith wasn't to come into the money unless the child didn't live to grow up. The pity of it. A young nurse came into the office to ask for something. The keys, I think, of the operating room, and Miss Hemphill broke off inconclusively as she hurried out the door. I was sorry that she left off just when she did. Poor Mrs. Meredith. Perhaps I was too emotional, but even before I saw her, I had begun to feel her pathos and her strangeness. My preparations took only a few minutes. In those days, I always kept a suitcase packed and ready for sudden calls, and it was not yet six o'clock when I turned from Tenth Street into Fifth Avenue and stopped for a minute before ascending the steps to look at the house in which Dr. Meredith lived. A fine rain was falling, and I remember thinking as I turned the corner how depressing the weather must be for Mrs. Meredith. It was an old house with damp-looking walls, though that may have been because of the rain, and a spindle-shaped iron railing which ran up the stone steps to the black door, where I noticed a dim flicker through the old-fashioned fanlight. Afterward, I discovered that Mrs. Meredith had been born in the house. Her maiden name was Coloron, and that she had never wanted to live anywhere else. She was a woman, this I found out when I knew her better, of strong attachments to both persons and places, and though Dr. Meredith had tried to persuade her to move uptown after her marriage, she had clung against his wishes to the old house in Lower Fifth Avenue. I dare say she was obstinate about it, in spite of her gentleness and her passion for the doctor. Those sweet, soft women, especially when they have always been rich, are sometimes amazingly obstinate. I have nursed so many of them since, women with strong affections and weak intellects, that I have come to recognize this type as soon as I set eyes upon it. 
My ring at the bell was answered after a little delay, and when I entered the house I saw the hall was quite dark except for a waning glow from an open fire which burned in the library. When I gave my name and added that I was the night nurse, the servant appeared to think my humble presence unworthy of illumination. He was an old Negro butler, inherited perhaps from Mrs. Meredith's mother, who I learned afterward had been from South Carolina, and while he passed me on his way up the staircase, I heard him vaguely muttering that he want going to turn them lights to a de child done playin'. To the right of the hall the soft glow drew me into the library, and crossing the threshold timidly, I stooped to dry my wet coat by the fire. As I bent there, meaning to start up at the first sound of a footstep, I thought how cozy the room was after the damp walls outside to which some bared creepers were clinging, and I was watching pleasantly the strange shapes and patterns the firelight made on the old Persian rug, when the lamps of a slowly turning motor flashed on me through the white shades at the window. Still dazed by the glare, I looked around in the dimness and saw a child's ball of red and blue rubber roll toward me out of the gloom of one of the adjoining rooms. A moment later, while I made a vain attempt to capture the toy, as it spun past me, a little girl darted airily, with peculiar lightness and grace, through the doorway and stopped quickly, as if in surprise at the sight of a stranger. She was a small child, so small and slight that her footsteps made no sound on the polished floor of the threshold. And I remember thinking while I looked at her that she had the gravest and sweetest face I've ever seen. She couldn't, I decided this afterward, have been more than six or seven, yet she stood there with a curious prim dignity, like the dignity of a very old person, and gazed up at me with ignomatical eyes. She was dressed in scotch plaid, with a bit of red ribbon in her hair, which was cut in a fringe over her forehead and hung very straight to her shoulders. Charming as she was, from her uncurled brown hair to the white socks and black slippers on her little feet, I recall most vividly the singular look in her eyes, which appeared in the shifting light to be of indeterminate color, for the odd thing about this look was that it was not the look of childhood at all. It was the look of profound experience of bitter knowledge. Have you come for your ball? I asked, but while the friendly question was still on my lips, I heard the servant returning. Even in my haste I made a second ineffectual grasp at the plaything which rolled with increased speed away from me into the dusk of the drawing-room. Then as I raised my head, I saw that the child also had slipped from the room, and without looking after her, I followed the old negro into the pleasant study above, where the great surgeon awaited me. Ten years ago, before hard nursing had taken so much out of me, I blushed very easily and I was aware at the moment when I crossed Dr. Meredith's study that my cheeks were the color of peonies. And, of course, I was a fool. No one knows this better than I do. But I had never been alone, even for an instant, with him before. And the man was more than a hero to me. He was, and there isn't any reason now why I should blush over the confession. Almost a god. At that age I was mad about the wonders of surgery, and Roland Meredith in the operating room was magician enough to have turned an older and more sensible head than mine. Added to his great reputation and his marvelous skill, he was, I'm sure of this, the most splendid-looking man even at forty-five that one could imagine, had he been ungracious 
had he been positively rude to me, I should still have adored him. But when he held out his hand and greeted me in the charming way he had with women, I felt that I would have died for him. It was no wonder that a saying went about the hospital that every woman he operated on fell in love with him. As for the nurses, well, there wasn't a single one of them who had escaped his spell. Not even Miss Hemphill, who could scarcely have been a day under fifty. I'm glad you could come, Miss Randolph. You were with Miss Hudson last week when I operated. I bowed to save my life. I couldn't have spoken without blushing the redder. I noticed your bright face at the time. Brightness, I think, is what Mrs. Meredith needs. She finds her day nurse depressing. His eyes rested so kindly upon me that I have suspected since that he was not entirely unaware of my worship. It was a small thing, heaven knows, to flatter his vanity. A nurse just out of training school, but to some men no tribute is too insignificant to give pleasure. You will do your best, I am sure. He hesitated for an instant, just long enough for me to perceive the anxiety beneath the genial smile on his face. And then he added gravely, We wish to avoid, if possible, having to send her away for treatment. I could only murmur in response, and after a few carefully chosen words about his wife's illness, he rang the bell and directed the maid to take me upstairs to my room. Not until I was ascending the stairs to the third story did it occur to me that he had really told me nothing. I was as perplexed about the nature of Mrs. Meredith's malady as I had been when I entered the house. I found my room pleasant enough. It had been arranged by Dr. Meredith's request. I think that I was to sleep in the house, and after my austere little bed at the hospital, I was agreeably surprised by the cheerful look of the apartment into which the maid led me. The walls were papered in roses, and there were curtains of flowered chintz at the window, which looked down on a small formal garden at the rear of the house. This the maid told me, for it was too dark for me to distinguish more than a marble fountain and a fir tree, which looked old, though afterward I learned that it was replanted almost every season. In ten minutes I had slipped into my uniform and was ready to go to my patient. But for some reason, to this day, I have never found out what it was that turned her against me at the start. Mrs. Meredith refused to receive me. While I stood outside her door, I heard the day nurse trying to persuade her to let me come in. It wasn't any use, however, and in the end I was obliged to go back to my room and wait until the poor lady got over her whim and consented to see me. That was long after dinner. It must have been nearer eleven than ten o'clock, and Miss Peterson was quite worn out by the time she came to fetch me. I'm afraid you'll have a bad night, she said as we went downstairs together. That was her way I soon saw to expect the worst of everything and everybody. Does she often keep you up like this? Oh, no, she is usually very considerate. I never knew a sweeter character, but she still has this hallucination. Here again, as in the scene with Dr. Meredith, I felt that the explanation had only deepened the mystery. Mrs. Meredith's hallucination, whatever form it assumed, was evidently a subject for evasion and subterfuge in the household. It was on the tip of my tongue to ask, what is her hallucination? But before I could get the words past my lips, we had reached Mrs. Meredith's door, and Miss Peterson motioned to me to be silent. As the door opened a little way to admit me, I saw that Mrs. Meredith was already in bed, and the lights were out except for a night lamp burning on the candle stand beside a book and a carafe of water. I won't go in with you, 
said Miss Peterson in a whisper, and I was on the point of stepping over the threshold when I saw the little girl in the dress of scotch plaid slip by me from the dusk of the room into the electric light of the hall. She held a doll in her arms, and as she went by, she dropped a doll's work basket in the doorway. Miss Peterson must have picked up the toy, for when I turned in a minute to look for it, I found that it was gone. I remember thinking that it was a little late for a child to be up. She looked delicate, too. But after all, it was no business of mine, and four years in a hospital had taught me never to meddle in affairs that don't concern me. There is nothing a nurse learns quicker than not to try to put the world to rights in a day. When I crossed the floor to the chair by Mrs. Meredith's bed, she turned over on her side and looked at me with the sweetest and saddest smile. You are the new night nurse, she said in a gentle voice, and from the moment she spoke, I knew there was nothing hysterical or violent about her mania, or hallucination, as they called it. They told me your name, but... I have forgotten it. Randolph, Margaret Randolph. I liked her from the start, and I think she must have seen it. You look very young, Miss Randolph. I'm twenty-two, but I suppose I don't look quite my age. People usually think I'm younger. For a minute she was silent, and while I settled myself into the chair by the bed, I thought how strikingly she resembled the little girl I had seen first in the afternoon, and then leaving her room a few moments ago. They had the same small, heart-shaped faces, colored ever so faintly, the same straight, soft hair between brown and flaxen, and the same large, grave eyes, set very far apart under arched eyebrows. What surprised me the most, however, was that they both looked at me with that ignomatical, vaguely wandering expression. Only in Miss Meredith's face the vagueness seemed to change now and then, to a definite fear, a flash, I had almost said, of startled horror. I sat quite still in my chair, until the time came for Mrs. Meredith to take her medicine, not a word passed between us. Then when I bent over her with a glass in my hand, she raised her head from the pillow and said in a whisper of suppressed intensity, You look kind. I wonder if you could have seen my little girl. As I slipped my arm under the pillow, I tried to smile cheerfully down on her. Yes, I've seen her twice. I'd know her anywhere by her likeness to you. A glow shone in her eyes and I thought how pretty she must have been before the illness took the life and animation out of her features. And I know you are good. Her voice was so strained and low that I could barely hear it. If you weren't good, you couldn't have seen her. I thought this queer enough, but all I answered was, she looked delicate to be sitting up so late. A quiver passed over her thin features, and for a minute I thought she was going to burst into tears. As she had taken the medicine, I put the glass back on the candle stand, and bending over the bed, smoothed the straight brown hair, which was as fine and soft as spun silk, back from her forehead. There was something about her. I don't know what it was that made you love her as soon as she looked at you. She's always had that light and airy way, though she was never sick a day in her life. She answered calmly after a pause. Then, groping for my hand, she whispered passionately, You must not tell him. You must not tell anyone that you have seen her. I mustn't tell anyone? Again, I had the impression that had come to me first in Dr. Meredith's study and afterward with Miss Peterson on the staircase, that I was seeking a gleam of light in the midst of obscurity. Are you sure there isn't anyone listening? 
that there isn't anyone at the door? She asked, pushing aside my arm and sitting up among the pillows. Quite, quite sure. They have put out the lights in the hall. And you will not tell him. Promise me that you will not tell him. A startled horror flashed from the vague wonder of her expression. He doesn't like her to come back because he killed her. Because he killed her? Then it was that light burst on me in a blaze. So this was Mrs. Meredith's hallucination. She believed that her child was dead. The little girl I had seen with my own eyes leaving her room, and she believed that her husband, the great surgeon we worshipped in the hospital, had murdered her. No wonder they veiled the dreadful obsession in mystery. No wonder that even Miss Peterson had not dared to drag the horrid thing into the light. It was the kind of hallucination one simply couldn't stand having to face. There is no use telling people things that nobody believes, she resumed slowly, still holding my hand in a grasp that would have hurt me if her fingers had not been so fragile. Nobody believes that he killed her. Nobody believes that she comes back every day to the house. Nobody believes, yet you saw her. Yes, I saw her. But why should your husband have killed her? I spoke soothingly as one would speak to a person who was quite mad. Yet she was not mad. I could have sworn this while I looked at her. For a moment she moaned inarticulately, as if the horror of her thought were too great to pass into speech. Then she flung out her thin, bare arm with a wild gesture. Because he never loved me, she said. He never loved me. But he married you, I urged gently after a moment in which I stroked her hair. If he hadn't loved you, why should he have married you? He wanted the money, my little girl's money. It all goes to him when I die. But he is rich himself. He must make a fortune from his profession. It isn't enough. He wanted millions. She had grown stern and tragic. No, he never loved me. He loved someone else from the beginning, before I knew him. It was quite useless. I saw to reason with her. If she wasn't mad, she was in a state of terror and despondency so black that it almost crossed the borderline into madness. I thought once of going upstairs and bringing the child down from her nursery. But after a moment's thought, I realized that Miss Peterson and Dr. Meredith must have long ago tried all these measures. Clearly, there was nothing to do except soothe and quiet her, as much as I could, and this I did until she dropped into a light sleep, which lasted well into the morning. By seven o'clock I was worn out, not from work, but from the strain of my sympathy, and I was glad indeed when one of the maids came in to bring me an early cup of coffee. Mrs. Meredith was still sleeping. It was a mixture of bromide and chloral that I had given her, and she did not wake until Miss Peterson came on duty an hour or two later. Then, when I went downstairs, I found the dining room deserted except for the old housekeeper, who was looking over the silver. Dr. Meredith, she explained to me presently, had his breakfast served in the morning room on the other side of the house. And the little girl? Does she take her meals in the nursery? She threw me a startled glance. Was it, I questioned afterward, one of distrust or apprehension? There isn't a little girl. Haven't you heard? Heard? No. Why, I saw her only yesterday. The look she gave me, I was sure of it now, was full of alarm. The little girl, she was the sweetest child I ever saw. 
died just two months ago of pneumonia. But she couldn't have died. I was a fool to let this out. But the shock had completely unnerved me. I tell you, I saw her yesterday. The alarm in her face deepened. That is Miss Meredith's trouble. She believes that she still sees her. But don't you see her? I drove the question home bluntly. No. She set her lips tightly. I never see anything. So I had been wrong after all, and the explanation, when it came, only accentuated the terror. The child was dead. She had died of pneumonia two months ago. And yet, I had seen her with my own eyes, playing ball in the library. I had seen her slipping out of her mother's room with her doll in her arms. Is there another child in the house? Could there be a child belonging to one of the servants? A gleam had shot through the fog in which I was groping. No, there isn't any other. The doctors tried bringing one once, but it threw the poor lady into such a state. She almost died of it. Besides, there wouldn't be any other child as quiet and as sweet-looking as Dorothea. To see her skipping along in her dress of scotch plaid used to make me think of a fairy, though they say that fairies wear nothing but white or green. Has anyone else seen her? The child, I mean. Any of the servants? Only old Gabriel, the colored butler, who came with Mrs. Meredith's mother from South Carolina. I've heard that Negroes often have a kind of second sight, though I don't know that that is just what I would call it. But they seem to believe in the supernatural by instinct. And Gabriel is so old and dotty, he does no work except answer the doorbell and clean the silver, that nobody pays much attention to anything that he sees. Is the child's nursery kept as it used to be? Oh, no. The doctor had all the toys sent to the children's hospital. That was a great grief to Mrs. Meredith. But Dr. Brandon thought, and all the nurses agreed with him, that it was best for her not to be allowed to keep the room as it was when Dorothea was living. Dorothea, was that the child's name? Yes, it means the gift of God, doesn't it? She was named after the mother of Mrs. Meredith's first husband, Mr. Ballard. He was the grave, quiet kind, not the least like the doctor. I wondered if the other dreadful obsession of Mrs. Meredith's had drifted down through the nurses or the other servants to the housekeeper. But she said nothing about it, and since she was, I suspected, a garrulous person, I thought it wiser to assume that the gossip had not reached her. A little later, when breakfast was over, and I had not yet gone upstairs to my room, I had my first interview with Dr. Brandon, the famous alienist who was in charge of the case. I had never seen him before, but from the first moment that I had looked at him, I took his measure almost by intuition. He was, I suppose, honest enough. I have always granted him that bitterly as I have felt toward him. It wasn't his fault that he lacked red blood in his brain, or that he had formed the habit, from long association with abnormal phenomena, of regarding all life as a disease. He was the sort of physician every nurse will understand what I mean, who deals instinctively with groups instead of individuals. He was long and solemn and very round in the face, and I hadn't talked to him ten minutes before I knew he had been educated in Germany, and that he had learned over there to treat every emotion as a pathological manifestation. I used to wonder what he got out of life, what anyone got out of life, who had analyzed away everything except the bare structure. When I reached my room at last, I was so tired that I could barely remember either the questions Dr. Brandon had asked or the directions he had given me. I fell asleep, I know, almost as soon as my head touched the pillow. 
and the maid who came to inquire if I wanted luncheon decided to let me finish my nap. In the afternoon, when she returned with a cup of tea, she found me still heavy and drowsy. Though I was used to night nursing, I felt as if I had danced from sunset to daybreak. It was fortunate, I reflected while I drank my tea, that every case didn't wear on one's sympathies as acutely as Mrs. Meredith's hallucination had worn on mine. Through the day, of course, I did not see Dr. Meredith, but at seven o'clock, when I came up from my early dinner on my way to take the place of Miss Peterson, who had kept on duty an hour later than usual, he met me in the hall and asked me to come into his study. I thought him handsomer than ever in his evening clothes, with a white flower in his buttonhole, and he was going to some public dinner, the housekeeper told me, but then he was always going somewhere. I believe he didn't dine at home a single evening that winter. Did Mrs. Meredith have a good night? He had closed the door after us, and turning now with the question, he smiled kindly as if he wished to put me at ease in the beginning. She slept very well after she took the medicine. I gave her that at eleven o'clock. For a minute he regarded me silently, and I was aware that his personality, his charm, had been focused upon me. It was almost as if I stood in the center of converging rays of light. So vivid was my impression of him. Did she allude in any way to her, to her hallucination? He asked, How the warning reached me. What invisible waves of sense perception transmitted the message, I have never known. But while I stood there, facing the splendor of the doctor's presence, every intuition cautioned me that the time had come when I must take sides in the household. While I stayed there, I must stand either with Mrs. Meredith or against her. She talked quite rationally, I replied after a moment. What did she say? She told me how she was feeling, that she missed her child, and that she walked a little every day about her room. His face changed. How I could not at first determine. Have you seen Dr. Brandon? He came in this morning to give me his directions. He thought her less well today. He has even advised me to send her to Rosedale. I have never even in secret tried to account for Dr. Meredith. He may have been sincere. I tell only what I know, not what I believe or imagine. And the human is sometimes as inscrutable, as inexplicable, as the supernatural. While he watched me, I was conscious of an inner struggle, as if opposing angels warred somewhere in the depths of my being. When at last I made my decision, I was acting less from reason. I knew that in obedience to the pressure of some secret current of thought, heaven knows, even then, the man held me captive while I defied him. Dr. Meredith, I lifted my eyes for the first time frankly to his. I believe that your wife is as sane as I am, or as you are. He started, and she did not talk freely to you. She may be mistaken, unstrung, piteously distressed in mind. I brought this out with emphasis, but she is not. I am willing to stake my future on it, a fit subject for an asylum. It would be foolish, it would be cruel to send her to Rosedale. Cruel, you say? A troubled look crossed his face, and his voice grew very gentle. You do not imagine that I could be cruel to her? No, I do not think that. My voice had also softened. We will let things go on as they are. Perhaps Dr. Brandon may have some other suggestions to make. He drew out his watch and compared it with the clock. 
Nervously, I observed, as if his action were a screen for his discomfiture or his perplexity. I must be going now. We will speak of this again in the morning. But in the morning we did not speak of it, and during the month that I nursed Mrs. Meredith I was not called again into her husband's study. When I met him in the hall or on the staircase, which was seldom, he was as charming as ever, yet, in spite of his courtesy, I had a persistent feeling that he had taken my measure on that evening, and that he had no further use for me. As the days went by, Mrs. Meredith seemed to grow stronger. Never, after our first night together, had she mentioned the child to me. Never had she alluded by so much as a word to her dreadful charge against her husband. She was like any other woman, recovering from a great sorrow, except that she was sweeter and gentler. It was no wonder that every one who came near her loved her, but there was a mysterious loveliness about her, like the mystery of light, not of darkness. She was, I have always thought, as much of an angel as it is possible for a woman to be on this earth. And yet, angelic as she was, there were times when it seemed to me that she both hated and feared her husband. Though he never entered her room while I was there, and I never heard his name on her lips until an hour before the end, still I could tell by the look of terror in her face whenever his step passed down the hall that her very soul shivered at his approach. During the whole month I did not see the child again, though one night, when I came suddenly into Mrs. Meredith's room, I found a little garden, such as children make out of pebbles and bits of box, on the window sill. I did not mention it to Mrs. Meredith, and a little later, as the maid lowered the shades, I noticed that the garden had vanished. Since then, I have often wondered if the child were invisible only to the rest of us, and if her mother still saw her. But there was no way of finding out except by questioning, and Mrs. Meredith was so well and patient that I hadn't the heart to question. Things couldn't have been better with her than they were, and I was beginning to tell myself that she might soon go out for an airing when the end came suddenly. It was a mild January day, the kind of day that brings the foretaste of spring in the middle of winter, and when I came downstairs in the afternoon, I stopped a minute by the window at the end of the hall to look down on the box maze in the garden. There was an old fountain bearing two laughing boys in marble in the center of the graveled walk and the water, which had been turned on that morning for Mrs. Meredith's pleasure, sparkled now like silver as the sunlight splashed over it. I had never before felt the air quite so soft and spring-like in January, and I thought, as I gazed down on the garden, that it would be a good idea for Mrs. Meredith to go out and bask for an hour or so in the sunshine. It seemed strange to me that she was never allowed to get any fresh air except the air that came through her windows. When I went into her room, however, I found that she had no wish to go out. She was sitting, wrapped in shawls, by the open window, which looked down on the fountain, and as I entered she glanced up from a little book she was reading. A pot of daffodils stood on the window sill. She was very fond of flowers, and we tried always to keep some growing in her room. Do you know what I was reading, Miss Randolph? She asked in her soft voice, and then she read aloud a verse, while I went over to the candle stand to measure out a dose of medicine. If thou hast two loaves of bread, sell one and buy daffodils, for bread nourisheth the body but daffodils delight the soul. That is very beautiful, don't you think so? 
I said yes, that it was beautiful, and then I asked her if she wouldn't go downstairs and walk about the garden. He wouldn't like it, she answered, and it was the first time she had mentioned her husband to me since the night I came to her. He doesn't want me to go out. I tried to laugh her out of the idea, but it was no use, and after a few minutes I gave up and began talking of other things. Even then it did not occur to me that her fear of Dr. Meredith was anything but a fancy. I could see, of course, that she wasn't out of her head, but sane persons I knew sometimes have unaccountable prejudices, and I accepted her dislikes as a mere whim or aversion. I did not understand then, and I may as well confess this before the end comes. I do not understand any better today. I am writing down the things I actually saw, and I repeat that I have never had the slightest twist in the direction of the miraculous. The afternoon slipped away while we talked. She talked brightly when any subject came up that interested her, and it was the last hour of the day, that grave, still hour, when the movement of life seems to droop and falter for a few precious minutes, that brought us the thing I had dreaded silently since my first night in the house. I remember that I had risen to close the window and was leaning out for a breath of mild air, when there was the sound of steps, consciously softened in the hall outside, and Dr. Brandon's usual knock fell on my ears. Then, before I could cross the room, the door opened, and the doctor entered with Miss Peterson. The day nurse I knew was a stupid woman but she never had appeared to me so stupid, so armored and encased in her professional manner as she did at that moment. I am glad to see that you have been taking the air. As Dr. Brandon came over to the window, I wondered maliciously what devil of contradictions had made him a distinguished specialist in nervous diseases. Who was the other doctor you brought this morning? asked Mrs. Meredith gravely, and that was all I ever heard about the visit of the second alienist. Someone who was anxious to cure you. He dropped into a chair beside her and patted her hand with his long, pale fingers. We're so anxious to cure you that we want to send you away to the country for a fortnight or so. Miss Peterson has come to help you get ready, and I've kept my car waiting for you. There couldn't be a nicer day for a little trip, could there? The moment had come at last, and I knew at once what he meant, and so did Mrs. Meredith. A wave of color flowed and ebbed in her thin cheeks, and I felt her body quiver when I moved from the window and put my arms on her shoulders. I was aware again as I had been aware that evening in Dr. Meredith's study of a current of thought that beat from the air around into my brain, though it cost me my career as a nurse and my reputation for sanity, I knew that I must obey that invisible warning. You're going to take me to an asylum, said Mrs. Meredith. He made some foolish denial or evasion. But before he had finished, I turned from Mrs. Meredith and faced him impulsively. In a nurse, this was flagrant rebellion, and I realized that the act wrecked my professional future. Yet I did not care. I did not hesitate. Something stronger than I was driving me on. Dr. Brandon, I said, I beg you, I implore you to wait until tomorrow. There are things I must tell you. A queer look came into his face, and I understood even in my excitement that he was mentally deciding in which group he should place me, to which class of morbid manifestations I must belong. Very well, very well. We will hear everything, he replied soothingly. 
but I saw him glance at Miss Peterson, and she went over to the wardrobe for Mrs. Meredith's fur coat and hat. Suddenly, without warning, Mrs. Meredith threw the shawls away from her and stood up. If you send me away, she said, I shall never come back. I shall never live to come back. The gray of twilight was just beginning, and while she stood there in the dusk of the room, her face shone out as pale and flower-like as the daffodils on the window sill. I cannot go away. She cried in a sharper voice. I cannot go away from my child. I saw her face clearly. I heard her voice, and then the horror of the scene sweeps back over me. I saw the door slowly open, and the little girl run across the room to her mother. I saw her lift her little arms, and I saw the mother stoop and gather her to her bosom. So closely locked were they in that passionate embrace that their forms seemed to mingle in the gloom that enveloped them. After this, can you doubt? I threw out the words almost savagely. And then, when I turned from the mother and child to Dr. Brandon and Miss Peterson, I knew breathlessly, oh, there was a shock in the discovery, that they were blind to the child. Their blank faces revealed the consternation of ignorance, not of conviction. They had seen nothing except the vacant arms of the mother and the swift, erratic gesture with which she stooped to embrace some phantasmal presence. Only my vision, and I have asked myself since if the power of sympathy enabled me to penetrate the web of material fact and see the spiritual form of the child. Only my vision was not blinded by the clay through which I look. After this, can you doubt? Dr. Brandon had flung my words back to me. Was it his fault, poor man, if life had granted him only the eyes of flesh? Was it his fault if he could see only half of the thing there before him? But they couldn't see. And since they couldn't see, I realized that it was useless to tell them. Within an hour they took Mrs. Meredith to the asylum, and she went quietly, though when the time came for parting from me, she showed some faint trace of feeling. I remember that at the last, while I stood on the pavement, she lifted her black veil, which she wore for the child, and said, Stay with her, Miss Randolph, as long as you can. I shall never come back. Then she got into the car and was driven off, while I stood looking after her with a sob in my throat, dreadful as I felt it to be. I didn't, of course, realize the full horror of it, or I couldn't have stood there quietly on the pavement. I didn't realize it, indeed, until several months afterward, when the word came that she had died in the asylum. I never knew what her illness was, though I vaguely recall that something was said about heart failure, a loose enough term. My own belief is that she died simply of the terror of life. To my surprise, Dr. Meredith asked me to stay on as his office nurse after his wife went to Rosedale, and when the news of her death came, there was no suggestion of my leaving. I don't know to this day why he wanted me in the house. Perhaps he thought I should have less opportunity to gossip if I stayed under his roof. Perhaps he still wished to test the power of his charm over me. His vanity was incredible in so great a man. I have seen him flush with pleasure when people turn to look at him in the street and I know that he was not above playing on the sentimental weaknesses of his patients. But he was magnificent, heaven knows. Few men, I imagine, have been the objects of so many foolish infatuations. The next summer Dr. Meredith went abroad for two months, 
and while he was away, I took my vacation in Virginia. When we came back, the work was heavier than ever. His reputation by this time was tremendous, and my days were so crowded with appointments and hurried flittings to emergency cases that I had scarcely a minute left in which to remember poor Mrs. Meredith. Since the afternoon when we went to the asylum, the child had not been seen in the house, and at last I was beginning to persuade myself that the little figure had been an optical illusion, the effect of shifting lights in the gloom of the old rooms, not the apparition I had once believed it to be. It does not take long for a phantom to fade from the memory especially when one leads the active and methodical life I was forced into that winter. Perhaps, who knows, I remember telling myself, the doctors may have been right after all, and the poor lady may have actually been out of her mind. With this view of the past, my judgment of Dr. Meredith insensibly altered. It ended, I think, in my acquitting him altogether. And then, just as he stood clear and splendid in my verdict of him, the reversal came so precipitately that I grow breathless now whenever I try to live it over again. The violence of the next turn in affairs left me, I often fancy, with the perpetual dizziness of the imagination. It was in May that we heard of Mrs. Meredith's death and exactly a year later, on a mild and fragrant afternoon, when the daffodils were blooming in patches around the old fountain in the garden, the housekeeper came into the office, where I lingered over some accounts, to bring me news of the doctor's approaching marriage. It is no more than we might have expected, she concluded rationally. The house must be lonely for him. He is such a sociable man, but I can't help feeling, she brought out slowly after a pause in which I felt a shiver pass over me. I can't help feeling that it is hard for that other woman to have all the money poor Mrs. Meredith's first husband left her. There's a great deal of money then, I asked curiously. A great deal, she waved her hand as if words were futile to express the sum. Millions and millions. They will give up this house, of course. That's done already, my dear. There won't be a brick left of it by this time next year. It's to be pulled down for an apartment house to be built on the ground. Again the shiver passed over me. I couldn't bear to think of Mrs. Meredith's old home falling to pieces. You didn't tell me the name of the bride, I said. Is she someone he met while he was in Europe? Dear me, no. She is the very lady he was engaged to before he married Mrs. Meredith. Only she threw him over, so people said, because he wasn't rich enough. Then she married some lord or grand prince from over the water. But there was a divorce, and now she is turned again to her old lover. He is rich enough now, I guess, even for her. It was all perfectly true, I suppose. It sounded as plausible as a story out of a newspaper. And yet, while she told me, I was aware of a sinister and impalpable hush in the atmosphere. I was nervous, no doubt. I was shaken by the suddenness with which the housekeeper had sprung her news on me. But as I sat there, I had quite vividly an impression that the old house was listening, that there was a real, if invisible, presence somewhere in the room or the garden. Yet, when an instant afterward I glanced through the long window which opened to the brick terrace, I saw only the faint sunshine over the deserted garden with its maze of box its marble fountain, and its patches of daffodils. The housekeeper had gone. One of the servants, I think, came for her, and I was sitting at my desk when the words of Mrs. Meredith on that last evening floated into my mind, 
the daffodils brought her back to me, for I thought, as I watched them growing so still and golden in the sunshine, how she would have enjoyed them. Almost unconsciously, I repeated the verse that she read to me. If thou hast two loaves of bread, sell one and buy daffodils. And it was at that very instant, while the words were on my lips, that I turned my eyes to the box maze and saw the child, skipping rope along the graveled path to the fountain, quite distinctly as clear as day. I saw her come with what children call the dancing step, between the low box borders to the place where the daffodils bloomed by the fountain. From her straight brown hair to her frock of scotch plaid and her little feet which twinkled with white socks and black slippers over the turning rope. She was as real to me as the ground on which she trod, or the laughing marble boys under the splashing water. Starting up from my chair, I made a single step toward the terrace. If I could only reach her, only speak to her, I felt that I might at last solve the mystery. But with my first call, with the first flutter of my dress on the terrace, the airy little form melted into the dusk of the maze. Not a breath stirred the daffodils. Not a shadow passed over the sparkling flow of the water. Yet, weak and shaken in every nerve, I sat down on the brick step of the terrace and burst into tears. I must have known that something terrible would happen before they pulled down Mrs. Meredith's home. The doctor dined out that night. He was with the lady he was going to marry, the housekeeper told me, and it must have been almost midnight when I heard him come in and go upstairs to his room. I was downstairs because I had been unable to sleep, and the book I wanted to finish I had left that afternoon in the office. The book, I can't remember what it was. It seemed to me very exciting when I began it in the morning, but after the visit of the child I found the romantic novel as dull as a treatise on nursing. It was impossible for me to follow the lines, and I was on the point of giving up and going to bed when Dr. Meredith opened the front door with his latch key and went up the staircase. There can't be a bit of truth in it, I thought over and over again, as I listened to his even step ascending the stairs. There can't be a bit of truth in it. And yet, though I assured myself that there couldn't be a bit of truth in it, I shrank with a creepy sensation from going through the house to my room in the third story. I was tired out after a hard day and my nerves must have reacted morbidly to the silence and the darkness. For the first time in my life I knew what it was to be afraid of the unknown, of the invisible, and while I bent over my book in the glare of the electric light, I became conscious presently that I was straining my senses for some sound in the spacious emptiness of the rooms overhead. The noise of a passing motor car in the street jerked me back from the intense hush of expectancy, and I can recall the wave of relief that swept over me as I turned to my book again and tried to fix my distracted mind on its pages. I was still sitting there when the telephone on my desk rang, with what seemed to my overwrought nerves a startling abruptness and the voice of the superintendent told me hurriedly that Dr. Meredith was needed at the hospital. I had become so accustomed to these emergency calls in the night that I felt reassured when I had rung up the doctor in his room and had heard the hearty sound of his response. He had not yet undressed, he said, and would come down immediately while I ordered back his car, which must have just reached the garage. I'll be with you in five minutes, he called as cheerfully 
as if I had summoned him to his wedding. I heard him cross the floor of his room, and before he could reach the head of the staircase, I opened the door and went out into the hall in order that I might turn on the light and have his hat and coat waiting. The electric button was at the end of the hall, and as I moved toward it, guided by the glimmer that fell from the landing above, I instinctively lifted my eyes to the staircase, which climbed dimly, with its slender mahogany balustrade, as far as the third story. Then it was, at the very moment, when the doctor, humming gaily, began his quick descent of the steps, that I distinctively saw, I will swear to this on my deathbed, a child skipping rope lying loosely coiled as if it had dropped from a careless little hand in the bend of the staircase. With a spring I had reached the electric button, flooding the hall with light, but as I did so while my arm was still outstretched behind me, I heard the humming voice change to a cry of surprise or terror, and the figure on the staircase tripped heavily and stumbled with groping hands into emptiness. The scream of the warning died in my throat while I watched him pitch forward down the long flight of stairs to the floor at my feet. Even before I bent over him, before I wiped the blood from his brow and felt for his silent heart, I knew that he was dead. Something, it may have been, as the world believes, a misstep in the dimness. Or it may have been, as I am ready to bear witness, a phantasmal judgment. Something had killed him at the very moment when he most wanted to live. You've been listening to The Shadowy Third by Ellen Glasgow. Be careful when going up or down staircases. I hope all of your dreams are pleasant dreams. Coming soon, a vampire story I think you'll like, especially if you like blood. Who doesn't like blood? I've enjoyed being with you, but now I must go. I hope to see you again soon. Take care. Thank you. <laughs>